Please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. I know Father's Day can be a day of mixed emotions. If you had a good father, the day to be grateful, the day to honor them. But if not, or if you did not experience any kind of father, this day can be a sad reminder of what should have been. But either way, as we just sang, as the Bible reminds us over and over again, because of what Jesus has done to save us, and through faith, we have a Heavenly Father who is good and perfect and loving. Amen? But there is no denying that our human, earthly families have had a deep and profound impact on us, for better or for worse. In pastoral, in pastoral counseling, we call these family of origin issues. We all have them. Because children, we all once were, we learn most of the basic and necessary skills for living by watching others, imitating them, making the same sounds, acting the same ways, mannerisms, facial expressions, how you walk, how you talk. So unless some other significant influence comes into your life, or as you get older, unless you make a conscious decision to differentiate from your family and be different, if, if those things don't happen, you will most likely repeat many of the behaviors of your family of origin. Now, our, our daughter, Emma, and her husband, Kai, have begun providing foster care. We got a picture of them here, and we're not supposed to show their faces, okay? That's how it works, I guess, with foster kids um, when they're online and things. So, But these are two beautiful kids. And by the way, Kai just graduated from the fire academy. He's now a fireman in the Henrico County Fire. Isn't that great? Way to go, Kai. <laughs> um, but they have a 13-year-old girl and a 2-year-old boy right now in their care. Which one of those do you think has, has developed more family of origin issues? The 13-year-old. <laughs> Pray for them. Um, foster kids come from difficult situations. That's why they're in uh, the care of another family. And Kai and Emma are modeling behaviors and attitudes and love and faith like these kids have never seen before. And it may change their life seeing something different. Some of you have had your life changed by a positive influence and model. This is actually part of God's plan. Okay, Paul unashamedly invited new believers in these new churches to imitate him, to follow his example. So 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. This was Paul's unashamed goal, to follow the example of Jesus to be like him as much as possible, even to imitate him. And now in our text today, he instructs the church to do this. Look at chapter 5, Ephesians 5, verse 1. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. We have a new family. We have a new father. And whatever influences we had in our lives before we came to faith, good or bad, we have a new example to follow and imitate. God himself. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, you remember Paul urged them, urge, I'm begging you, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling of a child of God. So this word worthy indicates weight. If something is worthy, it, it balances the scales. Here's the calling we've been given, and here's my, my life. Am I walking in a way that 
has, has, has weight and, and, and is worthy of that. Interestingly, our English word worship actually is derived from the Old English word worthship, attributing worth, value, or weight to something. So when we worship something, what are we doing? We are attributing worth and value and weight to what we worship. Now, last week we talked about the new self, the new identity, the new man, all that we have in Christ through faith. And what are we supposed to do? We're to take off the old. We are to put on the new. And if you'll remember in Ephesians 4.24, this is what it tells us about our new self, this new man. It says, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, so we, we have a new example to follow, to imitate, and we're to walk like Jesus walked. This is actually true worship when we do this. So this is our big idea today. When we imitate God, when we follow his example, what are we doing? We worship him. This is the point of Romans 12, verse 1. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to do what? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. When we do that, we're worshiping. So our text today tells us what this kind of worship actually looks like. So let's pray. God, thank you that you are our loving Heavenly Father, even as we have sung and even as we just read. We are your beloved children. God, we want to walk in a way worthy of being in your family. Lord, thank you that we are not under performance. This is not what um, gets us in your family. We're in your family because of what Jesus has done and simply our faith. So, Thank you, Lord, for saving us, making us alive, adopting us into your family. But now, Lord, help us to see what it means to live as a child of God, to walk in this way, and to imitate you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, fasten your seatbelts. We've got a lot of points in our text today. First, we are worshiping God when we walk in love. So let's start Ephesians 5, read the first two verses. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Okay, so this one is pretty obvious. Not much debate or issue here. It's just a matter of actually doing it, but it never hurts to be reminded that as God's children, first, we are to love like Jesus. John 13, 34 to 35, this is what Jesus told his disciples, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you also must love one another. By this Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's a command. It means it's not automatic. This is something that we have to choose to do. But as we said last week, this is also something God is doing in us by his Holy Spirit. You remember the, the, the first fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in our lives? is love. Galatians 5 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Something God is doing by His Spirit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I need more of all of that in my life. That's what God is doing by His Holy Spirit in me as I, as I yield to Him. Now, love is not simply a feeling. 
It's an action that's expressed and expresses itself in our lives as God's children. Secondly, when we serve like Jesus. Okay, verse 2 says, Jesus loved us and gave himself up for us. Now, we are not called to die on a cross like Jesus did. But our love for others should express itself in sacrificial giving, in serving others, especially in ways that cost us something. So when we serve Jesus by serving others, it, it's actually a form of worship to God. Hebrews 11, 13, 16 says this, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So when we do that, when we serve like Jesus, it, it's going to cost us something. And it's a sacrifice that God receives as worship. Because when we love, when we serve others like Jesus, here's what happens. We begin, third thing, to smell like Jesus. Paul says there in chapter 5, verse 2, when Jesus gave himself up for us, his sacrifice was what? A fragrant offering, a pleasing aroma to God. I don't know how that works, but in God's economy, somehow, our lives of obedience and faithfulness and loving and serving like Jesus in God's presence, somehow, it produces an aroma. Not only to God, but the Bible tells us even to others. It says, that person belongs to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 2 says this, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. We're in the family. We're, we're part of his team and he's He's, he's leading us in this procession. And then it says, through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, to the ones who are perishing, we're a fragrance from death to death. They don't like the smell. To the other, those who are being saved, we are a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? So when we walk in love, we're imitating God himself. We're saying to God, I want to reflect you in the world. You're so valuable to me. You're so worthy. So when we imitate God in this way, we, we worship him. Okay, that, that one's pretty obvious. The next one is a little less so. So when we're worshiping, we are worshiping God, secondly, when we walk in thanksgiving. Now before we read these verses, you need to know something about the city of Ephesus, the church where Paul was writing this. It was known, and it was, the center of worship for the Roman Greek goddess, Diana. She was the goddess of fertility. I thought of putting a picture up here, but it would not be appropriate in church. Right? You can do that on your own. Um, temple prostitution. Anything else you could imagine was part of the Ephesian culture. In fact, all of those things were, were integrally tied into their worship. Let's read verses 3 to 5. <clears throat> Paul is telling the church, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. You may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has 
no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. All right, so these would be some classic behaviors that we know are inappropriate for Christians to practice. Uh, Paul says these are improper. We know that. What is telling here is the fact that Paul says, hey, you know what, these things, these behaviors, they're actually idolatry. So idolatry happens whenever um, there's anything that we desire more than God. It becomes an idol. Because what happens is we, we give it more weight in our lives than God. And this has more worth. Which means these things are actually a worship disorder. So Paul doesn't just say, don't do these things. He says in verse 4, instead, let there be thanksgiving. So when we walk in thanksgiving, it actually helps us overcome the idolatry, first, of immorality. Helps us overcome the idolatry of immorality. One definition of sin, we've talked about it, is when we try to meet a legitimate need in our life in an illegitimate way. I mean, if, if you dig deep enough in your heart, you'll probably find that, that most sin in your life is the result of trying to meet a, a real valid need in your life, but instead of trusting God for His provision, for that need, you go for the shortcut. See, God has a legitimate provision for our sexual needs, a covenant marital relationship between a man and a woman. And marriage is a commitment, it's a sacrifice, it's, it's hard work. Sinful desires are actually rooted in a dissatisfaction with what we are currently experiencing. So instead of gratitude and thankfulness to God, we're walking in dissatisfaction. So the antidote to immorality is not simply, don't do it. The answer is to choose to be thankful to God. And in the same way, this helps us overcome the idolatry of greed or covetousness. Greed is actually a worship disorder. We want something else more than we want God. Now for most people, this is just what they were trained to do by the influence of others around them, family, friends, social media. They don't even see their, their, their desire for something as greed or covetousness. They just see it as something they deserve something they want, something they should have. See, we need a new example to follow. We need to be set free from this prison of never being satisfied, of always wanting a little bit more. It's something that we actually have to learn. This is what Paul did. He tells the Philippian church this. He says, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. But I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all of this through him who gives me strength. So contentment is the result of walking in thanksgiving. Whatever your circumstance, to say, God, you know what I need. God, thank you that you are a loving Heavenly Father. God, thank you for giving me the strength to be content in any situation. And when we walk in that kind of thanksgiving, it's a form of worship. Trusting in God, it's telling him that, God, I'm satisfied because you are worthy. So the next time you're tempted to immorality or to greed, 
do this. Stop and start thanking God. Just start giving thanks for his provision, for the circumstances of your life, that he's in control. And when you're thanking God like that, you, you, you begin worshiping him with thanksgiving. It can actually, that discipline of thanking God can actually grow your sense of satisfaction and contentment. Now, it can also help you overcome the idolatry of hate. Now, that's not what the text says there in verse 4. Uh, so the next point there, it helps you overcome hate. The text says filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking. Other translations say obscenity. But I think we know that the point of most of that kind of talk is to express dislike, even hatred, to put others down so maybe we feel better about ourselves. Foul language is such a pervasive part of our culture. It's hard not to be influenced or affected by it. Everywhere you go, it seems people use this kind of language without shame. It's just part of their vocabulary. They learned it growing up uh, at home, at school, at work, in music, in movies. I mean, it's just everywhere. It's normal behavior for those who do not worship God. But for those of us who do, we need to walk a different path. So try giving thanks. The antidote to immorality, to greed, to hateful, foul speech is thanksgiving. Give thanks. Now the consequences for these worship disorders are severe. I mean, look at verse 5. There's no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now that doesn't mean if you failed in one of these areas, you're going to hell. It's not what that means. It means if these are the unrepentant patterns of your life, no matter what faith you profess, your actions are actually revealing your heart. Now, there is no unforgivable sin other than not having true saving faith. The church that Paul is writing to here was full of people um, who had done all of these things. But now they were saved. And instead of continuing in idolatry, Paul says, don't walk that path anymore. Walk in thankfulness. Worship God by, by imitating him, by imitating Jesus. And then Paul continues, uh, we are worshiping God, thirdly, when we walk as light. 8 says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Jesus actually told his disciples the same thing. Matthew 5, 14, 16, to his disciples, he said, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So light and dark are a constant metaphor in the Bible for God's ways or the fallen world's ways. Ephesus was a very dark place. Our world today is a very dark place. Now I think we do a pretty good job in Naples of putting on a nice front, a nice facade, but the darkness is real. Many places in our world have no facade. They flaunt evil and darkness. And the warning in our text here is clear. Stay out of darkness. Firstly, because it's a deception. Look at verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. 
Okay, so here's, here's the deception, the empty words. It's no big deal. It'll be okay. Hey, none of us are perfect. Little of this, little of that. It won't really hurt. God is gracious. He'll forgive you. Well, that last thing is true. <laughs> he will forgive you. But you should never use God's forgiveness presumptuously. Paul says the wrath of God comes because of these things. So if the pattern of your life is unrepentant darkness, there's a really good chance you're not saved. But if you are saved, and you struggle with darkness, you dabble in darkness, maybe you think you can get away with a little darkness, you're living in a very dangerous place. Galatians 6 tells us this, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows, whatever Whoever sows to please his flesh, okay, these are the things that we've just been talking about, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So here's the application. Don't dabble in darkness. Don't be deceived. It doesn't mean if situation in your life, you, you, you fail and then you repent, that's a normal part of life. But don't be deceived in thinking that you can get away with it. So, stay out of the darkness. Secondly, because it's not your partner. It's not your partner. Let's read uh, verses 7 to 8 first. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You need to be very careful about the friends that you choose. You are not strong enough to have bad friends. We learned that in the book of Proverbs. The Bible says, bad company corrupts good morals. Now, this doesn't mean that you withdraw from the world, you just live in a Christian bubble. It's not what it means. It, it means you don't participate in the behaviors associated with darkness. You're not strong enough. It will corrupt you. But even more so, that's not who you are anymore. Before you got saved, before God made you alive, you were dead. You were darkness. But now, the new you, <laughs> you are light in the Lord. That's your true identity in Christ. So, walk in it. Walk as children of light. Look at verse 9. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and true. So, choosing to walk in light, as light, it's an important way that we, we worship God. And it'll bear fruit in your life if you don't give up. Walking in darkness is unfruitful. Look at verse 10. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of of darkness. And then Paul continues. He says, stay away from darkness because it is to be exposed. He says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, verse 11, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So, to expose the works of darkness, all we have to do is shine. That's it. We reflect the light of Christ, which has shone on us, so we are light. 
now in the Lord. See, our light is actually His light. Now, it's very tempting when deeds of darkness are exposed, it's very tempting to talk about them, read about them, even gloat a bit over the downfall of someone whose sin has caught up with them. It's easy to feel a little smug about it. But look at verse 12. It's a warning. So be careful. Don't talk about it. God's taking care of it. You simply shine. Set your face toward Jesus and let His light do the work of exposing the darkness around you because it's reflecting off of you. Jesus is the light of the world and when we imitate Him and look to His example and reflect His light, we're worshiping God. It's a powerful weapon against darkness. Two more areas. We're worshiping God fourth when we walk in wisdom. Read verses 15 to 17. Paul says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, these are pretty straightforward, but even so, we can't take this for granted. Paul says, look carefully, pay attention, we must be careful first to live with urgency. The, the time that, that we have to play our part is limited. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. Our lives here on earth are a vapor compared to eternity. Now, time is not evil. When he says the days are evil, what he means is that we live in a Time of evil. This is our moment to shine. So he's saying, don't put off to tomorrow what you can do to shine today. Be careful. Make the most of every opportunity. Specifically to do the second thing, to do God's will. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, that's not really a mystery. It's right here in the Bible. It's part of the process of, of maturity, being part of Team Jesus in the church, spurring each other on to love and good deeds. Playing your part. That, that is, we know, that is God's will. The question is, are you, are you doing that? Now there's a parallel passage to this in Paul's letter to the Colossian church in chapter 3 of that book. Uh, we'll put it on the screen. He says to that church, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Okay, so, so the message of Christ, it must penetrate every part of us. And as we're imitating God, as we're following his example, as we're walking in love, as we're choosing to walk in thanksgiving, to walk as light and in wisdom, here's, here's the critical element that we must imitate. We are worshiping God, fifthly, when we walk in the Spirit. Read verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery or wastefulness, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, so how are we imitating God, or how are we imitating Jesus when we do this? We talked about this uh, in our study of the Gospel of Luke. 
Jesus was fully God and fully man. But in his life on earth, he put aside his, his divine nature. Philippians 2 tells us he, he emptied himself. He was still fully God, but he chose to live fully as a man. So, if he was doing that, how did he live a holy, supernatural, human life? A lot of times our default answer is, well, he was God. Yes, but he, he put that aside. He didn't choose to use his superpower <laughs> you know, to overcome the temptations, the struggles of a human life. This is what he did. He did it just like he invites us to do, by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4, if you'll remember, it describes what happened at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry after his baptism in the Jordan River. This is what Luke tells us. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And then Jesus quoted a scripture that was being fulfilled in him at that moment. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. This is really good news that Jesus lived his earthly life the same way he encourages us and tells us to do, and that is to walk in the Spirit. Now, Paul already told the church in Ephesians 1, that through their faith, God had sealed them with the Holy Spirit. He says they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. He's already told us that God's Spirit indwelled them. And that was all the result of their salvation. By the grace of God. But now, in chapter 5, what is he saying? He's, he's urging them. He's imploring them with, with this command, be Filled with the Spirit. Now, grammatically, he's using a passive, present, continuous verb. This is how you could translate it. Let God fill you now and keep on being filled. Don't stop letting God fill you with his Spirit. How does this work? I don't want to add to Scripture. There's a mystery to this. But clearly, the only way I can walk in a manner worthy of the calling I have as a child of God, the only way I can do that is to have God living in me, empowering me, filling me with His Holy Spirit day by day, hour by hour. He says he will do it. But I have to let him by faith. As you do that, here's what happens. This radically changes, first, your relationships. Look at verse 19. So, be filled with the Spirit is the verb, and then there's three supporting uh, verbs that are tied to that command to be filled with Spirit. First is verse 19, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Okay, well, certainly that refers to our singing together. But it's more than that. The Colossians account we just read earlier clarified that these songs are part of our teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, as the message of Christ dwells in us. So when you're filled with the Spirit, Christ's message, it just flows through you as you let that message dwell in you. Now, people loved being around Jesus, especially sinners, not because he lived and talked like them, They loved being around Jesus because he had the words of life. He spoke truth to them 
in love. He, he loved the sinner, but not the sin. He admonished people with the Word of God. That's something we need to learn to imitate, to follow His example, to speak with one another in ways that spur one another on to love and good deeds. Now, it doesn't mean that all we ever talk about is the Bible. But it does mean that we often do. Because we see life through the lens of God's truth. So we can't help but talking about it. You need to find the people. You need to find the places and the spaces where that is happening so that you can learn that from others. It can't just happen on a Sunday morning. It needs to happen at other times during the week where we can be spurring each other on and encouraging one another by, by looking at our lives through the lens of God's Word. So, invite God's Word, invite God's Spirit into your relationships. Walking in the Spirit will radically change those relationships. It will also radically change your prayers. Look at verse 20. So, being filled with the Spirit, verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, we already talked about how thanksgiving is the antidote to distorted worship. Now, this doesn't mean that we thank God for evil, but we can be thankful, as Romans 8.28 tells us, that for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, that he works all things, everything, together for our good and for good. So, In the eyes of your heart, when the eyes of your heart are open, as Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, when your eyes of your heart are open so that you can see all that God is doing, all that he is, all that we are in his eyes as his beloved children, when you can see God is capable of, of doing anything. He's in control. His spirit dwells in me and fills me. Oh, that radically changes me. It changes my prayers and my worship. That's why Paul prioritized that prayer. Uh, he prayed those things for the church. And he's urging us to let God fill us with his spirit because it will radically change your attitude. Verse 21. Be filled with the spirit, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay, submitting, submission is an attitude of I put you ahead of me. I defer out of my reverence, my, my fear, my awe of God to trust Him to have my back. So, I can serve you. This is imitating God because this is what God has done for us in Christ. Back to the Philippians 2 passage. Paul tells the church, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And then he says this, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Okay, so the reason we have to allow God to continuously fill us with His Spirit is, friends, we're a work in progress. Amen? I am. <laughs> uh, we can't do this on our own. We need one another. I need the team in my life. Not to get saved. That's done, friends. That's done. I need all of these things in my life. I need you in my life to be able to play our parts, for me to play my part, for us to grow up 
and experience and know Jesus more and more. That's God's plan. Amen? We'll continue this in two weeks. Let's, let's pray. God, thank you for your generous provision in our lives. Thank you for um, your patience as we struggle, as we are with this work in progress. God, we right now surrender to you. We submit to you. We say, God, you do your work in our lives by your spirit. Help us to walk in love. Help us to walk in thankfulness. Help us to walk as light. God, I pray that you would help us to walk to be filled by your spirit moment by moment, day by day. It's the only way we will be able to do this. Thank you for your provision for us. Let's, uh, let's stand together and again, let's praise him. Let's thank him for his provision.